Are we ready for this? We're ready. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. As you can see, Pastor Heather is not here today. Her husband and her and the kids are in Colorado doing some R and R. I don't know if she's skiing or not, but probably the kids and Jason are for sure. So, um, thank you for being here today. Um, are there any announcements or prayer requests? I just had one announcement given to me. Does anybody have anything else? Uh, yes, go ahead. Maybe we need a prayer for the have no broken bones or something. <laughs> so that we don't trip. have any broken yes. bones, pastor and family. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, man. And I was just told that the uh, water uh, company has issued an advisory about the water here in Shelby that it's not to be drank or used for... Oil advisory is official. Excuse me? Oil advisory is official. Oil advisory, yeah, okay. Days, I think. Okay, everybody knows what that means. So just a word of warning if you hadn't heard about that. I don't think there's no water back there, so... I wouldn't drink any water from the tank here. And, uh, okay. If you would please stand, we'll go through our confession and forgiveness. <coughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sins, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you are strange You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the things that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your word your will, and your outward way of love. We distrust others and ignore those in need for all we have done and left undone. Forgive us, gracious God, for you know our thoughts before they are even on our tongues. How vast is God's grace? Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away. In baptism, we are claimed as God's own beloved and sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Indeed, we are forgiven. Life in the light of God's grace, live in the light of life, God's grace, loving and serving Him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And we will have our first hymn for this morning.
Almighty God, look upon the ardent desires of your humble servants and stretch forth the right hand of your majesty to be our defense against all our enemies. Grant this, we pray, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We'll have the first reading now, please. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into, into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you, throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you, and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Please read responsibly Psalm 22, verses 23 to 31. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For he is not despised and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied, but those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For the kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow, bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Prosperity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. The second reading comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is today's reading.
Today's gospel message comes from Mark chapter 8. Although the uh, video for the sermon today does not focus on this verse, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. And others said, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. After three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the Holy Angels. And now we'll watch a video. Do you promise? As a younger priest, I learned how important it is for the ministers of the church to visit nursing homes and assisted living facilities. In my first parish assignment, I was blessed to visit with elderly women and men who lived in those communities near the church. And there's one woman who stands out in my mind. Almost every time I went to visit, her daughter was also visiting with her. So the three of us would chat, and then we'd pray together, share a passage of scripture, and be nourished by Holy Communion. But when it came time for me to leave, the older woman would grab me by the hand and say, with all seriousness, promise me you will come back. And, and then she'd squeeze my hand and repeat, promise me. Her daughter received the same message as she left. Her mother would grab her hand and say, promise you'll come back. Do you promise? Her daughter later told me why her mother was so insistent on that promise. Turns out that her husband had been killed in World War II. His body was found far from his unit. Somehow he had gotten separated from his fellow soldiers, and his wife, who was now elderly, was always haunted by the thought that her husband had died alone and isolated. And now, years later, she was frightened of the same thing. So she was insistent. Promise me you will come back. Years later, dementia had robbed this woman of her memories. The day before she died, I went to her room and led her family in prayer. And the older woman, she didn't seem to recognize any of us. But as her daughter leaned over to give her mother a kiss, the look of recognition came across her face. She said her daughter's name, and then she declared, you came back 
just like you promised. Such joy. Joy because of a promise made and a promise kept. Our God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. And that can become the source of our joy. Today in the book of Genesis, we encounter Abram and Sarai, and they have heard powerful promises from God. Their amazing story begins in Genesis chapter 12. The Bible says that Abram is 75 years old when God directs him to pack up his wife, his family, and his portable possessions and to follow God wherever God leads. And as part of that invitation to leave the familiar to undertake this adventure, God makes an astounding promise to Abram and Sarai. They've never had any children. Yet God promises that they will become the parents of a nation. What a promise. This couple was, was barren up to this point, and yet now God declares, your descendants will be numerous. We would assume that such a promise would bring them joy. Yet as we keep reading the book of Genesis, we find that God has to keep repeating this promise to Abram and Sarai. And you may begin to wonder, are Abram and Sarai listening? Or in some way, are they like the, the woman in the nursing home, grabbing onto God's hand and insisting, do you really promise? Do you promise? Now, God makes the promise in chapter 12, and then in chapter 13, God repeats his promise. I will make your descendants so numerous that they cannot be counted. Then in chapter 15, God's promise becomes a covenant. And yet Abram wonders if perhaps, well, maybe one of his servants will inherit everything. So God repeats the promise again, your descendants will be numerous like the stars in the sky. God keeps promising, you will have children. I will make this happen. But in chapter 16, Abram and Sarai appear to be, I don't know, dissatisfied with God's timing. You can almost picture them looking up to heaven and saying, we're not getting any younger. Do you know that? True. God has repeated his promise over and over again. But Abram and Sarai decide to take matters into their own hands. Sarai encour encourages Abram to be intimate with her maidservant, Hagar. <laughs> That's certainly one way to have a child. What could go wrong with this plan? God has to intervene, and once again, God repeats his promise to Abram and Sarai. You will have numerous descendants. Which brings us to the passage that we read on this second Sunday of the season of Lent. And if I ask you to guess what God does in this chapter, by now you probably get the right answer. You got it. Once again, God makes a covenant promise to Abram and Sarai. You will have a child. Your descendants will be numerous. <laughs> I promise. I really promise. The living God makes transformative promises to Abram and Sarai in today's passage. Listen to what God says. God says, I am God Almighty. I will make my covenant with you. This is my covenant. I have made you and I shall make you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. 
you will be fruitful, and Sarai will bear a son. Such beautiful, transformative promises. All the more remarkable because God has been making these promises, repeating these promises over and over again since chapter 12. But this time in chapter 17, Abram and Sarai are so transformed by their encounter with this promise-making, promise-keeping God, that they are apparently changed to the core of their being. How do I know that? Because their names are changed. So often in the Bible, when someone has a life-changing encounter with the living God, their names get changed. In the biblical world, your name represents your identity and your destiny. So if you have an encounter with God, an encounter that changes who you are and what your destiny is, then very often your name changes. Jacob encounters God, and his name becomes Israel. Saul encounters the risen Christ, his name becomes Paul. Simon becomes Peter. And on and on it goes. The name Abram means exalted father. But the name Abraham means father of a multitude. His name tells us his destiny. The name Sarai means princess. The name Sarah, well, that's a subtle shift in meaning, indicating that she is the princess of many. You see, God has promised. God is acting through this couple to create a people who will become the blessing through which God saves the world. And in chapter 17, God eloquently repeats that promise in a way that transforms Abraham and Sarah. As I read chapters 12 through 17 of the book of Genesis, I am obviously struck by the fact that God keeps repeating his covenant promise to Abraham and Sarah. And yet at times, Abraham and Sarah behave as if they're not always listening to God when he promises, or apparently they think it's up to them to help God figure out how to fulfill his promises. Remember, God promises, Abraham and Sarah, you will have a child. Yet Abraham suggests, well, maybe we'll just have to count my servant as my heir. God promises, Abraham and Sarah, you will have a child. Then Sarah suggests, well, let's have Hagar give birth and count Ishmael as our heir. God keeps promising, but Abraham and Sarah, do they doubt? Don't they trust? If God is speaking so clearly, then why does God have to keep repeating himself? Or is it possible that on many occasions, Abraham and Sarah are not listening to the promise-making God? Sure, they hear his words, sometimes. But is it also possible that, at other times, they're listening not to God, but to the voice of their own fears? Don't they seem almost haunted by a fear that God cannot or will not fulfill this amazing promise that he's made? Sure, God says it. <laughs> but his timing seems so slow. Sure, God promises, but maybe we're the ones who are gonna to have to work out the details. When they listen to the authentic voice of God, they hear promises that transform Abraham and Sarah to their core. When they listen to their own fears and their doubts, they almost seem to panic. 
concluding that the God of the universe can't do what he promises. But in the very next chapter of Genesis, the promise-making God sends three messengers to Abraham and Sarah with the announcement that the time is fulfilled. The birth of the, of the long-promised son is imminent. Promises made, promises kept. A God who can be trusted. In the fullness of time, God sent his only son, fulfilling promises God made through the ancient prophets. And throughout his preaching ministry, Jesus makes remarkable promises, promises so transformative that they will change us to our core. And perhaps the question that Abraham and Sarah face is the question that we face as well. Will we listen to Jesus as he makes these promises, trusting that he will do what he promised? Or are we going to listen to our fears and worries? Listen to what Jesus said in his preaching. For instance, at one point, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest. A promise made, a promise kept. Jesus said, my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. A promise made, a promise kept. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. A promise made, a promise kept. Jesus said, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. A promise made, a promise kept. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and whoever eats this bread will live forever. A promise made, a promise kept. Jesus said, the Son of Man will be crucified, and on the third day he will rise. A promise made, a promise kept. Jesus said, behold, I am with you always. A promise made, a promise kept. The promises made by the Son of God will change us to the core if we listen to them. He said it, he'll do it. He promises. Prom Well, I had the advantage of the printed script of what he was saying up there. And I got to tell you, I'm going to hang on to that because that list of promises at the end, those are great. I'm going to keep my eye on those because there's times when I forget that God keeps his promises. So with that in mind, let's, uh, can I have you all stand? You look like you're about ready to fall asleep. No, I'm kidding. And let's sing the solid rock.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we'd like to enter a time of prayer. Please join me in prayer. Father God Almighty, we come before you with our prayers and petitions. We know that you hear our prayers, and we know that you have our best interest at heart. Lord, we just want to lift up to you Pastor Heather and Jason and Zachary and Noah. Pray that you would help them to have a good time of rest and relaxation and rejuvenation. And Lord, we pray that you would bring them back safely home and uh, return them to us as we continue on. For peace and joy, gracious Father, we give you thanks that we have been justified through faith and we have peace with you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant us the hope that comes with this amazing knowledge of reconciliation with you. We pray for the world to accept the good news that we are saved by your grace and are set free to live fully for you alone. Lord, in your mercy. For the sake of the world, merciful God, forgive us, renew us, and heal us for the sake of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. May we boldly confess your truth in all the world, so others may come to know you. Let us walk by faith and share that faith with those we need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For pursuing peace, Father God, you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us to pursue peace and unity. Let us be a beacon of light to guide others towards your unwavering love. We pray for all who struggle in this world, especially those who live in war-torn countries or places where freedom is not a reality. May they find solace in your promise of eternal peace with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For healing restoration, Lord, our almighty healer, we pray for all those who are sick, whether at home or in the hospital especially those that are on our prayer list and those that we hold in our hearts at this moment, Lord. Guide their hearts and minds as they begin the healing process, that they are comforted to know you are with them and you know their every need. We pray for their healing restoration to be rooted in their faith and love for you. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, grant, O God, according to your good and gracious will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, at this time of recognizing our offerings and giving back to our gracious God that has given so much to us. I just want to mention that there are offering plates at the uh, back of the pews there. And uh, thank you for your giving, whether it's here or if you choose to uh, give online. All gifts are greatly appreciated. Uh, our offering prayer, if you would join me. O oh God, whose giving knows no meaning, we offer up the treasures that you have given to us. We offer up the skills and time that you have graciously given to us. We offer up ourselves in service and grace. 
receive these gifts by your grace, multiply and use them through the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish Christ's work of love in the world. Amen. If you could remain standing for one more moment, please uh, let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. And our final hymn for this morning is Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. Go in peace. Praise be God.